Welcome to the follow-up question. I'm your host, Michael Ashford. I've set out to uncover amazing and insightful stories by interviewing people from all different backgrounds and perspectives. And I know there are a ton of other interview shows out there, but only this show, only the follow-up question, aims to also teach you what it means to listen more than you speak so that you can become a more thoughtful and informed person. I'm a former journalist who believes everyone has a story to tell. And though we might not agree on everything, when we commit to listening and asking questions, we realize we're not so different after all in the end. And so the more questions you're asking, the more you're listening. And the more you're listening, the more connections can be made. My goal is to get beneath cliche answers to reveal the real nuggets of experiences, desires, dreams, and thoughts that make every person who they truly are. Today on the show, I welcome Alex Perry, who is a speech language pathologist. She used to do that line of work in helping people who could not speak come to find their words, come to find language in what little way they could sometimes. And you'll hear her describe the little victories and successes that come in that line of work. And now with the company that she has founded, practically speaking, she's teaching other people. She's using that experience of being a speech pathologist to help others say what they need to say, say something and feel confident when they feel that they have nothing to say or are too scared. What happens when fear of judgment and fear of rejection consume us more than our confidence in our ability to get our thoughts and ideas across? Well, that's what Alex helps with. She helps with that confidence. And one of the questions that I asked her that I thought was really interesting in her answer, and I, I can't wait for you to hear it, is how do we push back against someone who is wrong factually, but confident in their answer or in their words? That can be a very intimidating thing. And I talked to Alex about that in this episode. So Alex is a wonderful person. I love her mission of helping others speak and share their stories with confidence. And I know you all will have something great to take away from this conversation. Come back at the end when I wrap things up with a few final thoughts. And don't forget to go to thefollowupquestion.com and subscribe to the newsletter. I'm now committing to each Friday sending out my longer form thoughts on the key takeaway from that episode or that interview that week. So this Friday, I'll be sending out a newsletter that has specific thoughts about this episode and what Alex has to say. So go to thefollowupquestion.com slash newsletter and sign up there. All right, let's get into it. Here's my interview with Alex Perry. I was watching your video uh, that's that you attach in your signature of your emails, and something you said resonated and stuck out to me. Uh, you said you help people say what they need to say. And I'd love to hear, going deeper than that, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by helping people say what they need to say? So the mission behind my work, just to catch people up, the why behind what I do is I spent years working as a speech language pathologist. So dealing with folks who either by accident or illness or injury lost their ability to speak or were born with an impaired ability to speak. And so I watched their frustration. I watched their pain. And so when I talk about helping people say what they need and want to say, we have a gift, you and I sitting here being able to speak clearly and coherently and fluently. And so, so much of what holds people back is not actually their ability to speak because people will say, oh, I'm a terrible speaker. I can't speak. I'm no good at it. And I'm like, liar. You're a liar, liar, pants on fire. That's not true. You can speak very, very well. The things that are holding you back are typically mindset related perhaps a little bit of skill and knowledge related, but most of the time people are not saying what they need and want to say out of fear. Why did your job as a speech pathologist, why did that become more mission-minded for you rather than just a job that you did that you left at work? Mm, why did it become more mission-minded? Well, healthcare is a tough place to be. And 
I, man, something that I just didn't leave at work. That's a really good question. It, it really stemmed around that I knew not only was I technically skilled at helping people do the technical work of speaking, but that I was the person in the department. I was the person that people would come to and they would always say, hey, Alex, can you help me with this? Can you help me think about this? Would you give me some advice? How do I say this? You're so good with words, Alex. I've heard that a lot. You're just so good with words. And so it, it really started like in my brain is I'm going to just play around with this. And what could I do with people? If this is what I can do with people who have lost the ability, what could I do with people who already had the ability? I knew I had a bent towards coaching. I knew I wanted to coach. And so that's, that's where the journey sort of started for me. Not sort of, it's where the journey started for me. Is there a, a particular person that you worked with that you can point to and say that was particularly inspiring for me that they were able to say this thing or, you know, eke out this word that they had been wanting. Like, is there, is there an example from your time as, as a pathologist? Absolutely. So I can point to two. Yeah. So first one pediatrics. So I spent about uh, seven years in pediatrics and I worked with a little girl named Delilah, and I have permission from her family to share the story. So okay, yeah. I've talked about Delilah before. Delilah was um, born, if you've ever heard of something called, it's like feral child syndrome, or it's a utter and complete abuse and neglect, where she was basically born at home. No one knew she existed until she was five. Oh. She had a very rare syndrome that left her without eyelids and with all types of mental defect capacity, like just reduced mental capacity and had been born to a mother who basically left her in her crib and neglected her. So that mom herself, I think, had some issues that were, you know, that made it hard for her to care for a child, let alone a child with this kind of issues. So by the time they found Delilah, she was five. No one knew what she had existed. They only found her because there were other children in the home and, and someone had said, hey, I think this mom is struggling. We need to get some people in here to help. And so they found Delilah. Delilah was subsequently put into foster care and sent with a family to be you know, fostered and then ultimately was adopted by Kim and Scott. And when they brought Delilah to us, she was here's this five-year-old that you would expect to be able to talk and interact and play. And that is not who she was. In fact, we used to joke because she would just scream and throw fits and she would lay on the floor and pretend that she was having seizures. I mean, it was, it was really, really hard. And we knew that her chances of having clear, fluent speech were pretty low at this point between the neglect and between the cognitive deficits. But I can still remember working with her because we're like, we're going to get as much verbal as we can. So I can remember the day that she said, mama. Mm. And I can remember how hard we worked just on those two, like mom, ma, like that's so basic, right? But to her mom, adoptive mom Kim at the time, it was miraculous, right? Like for her to be able to say mama, mama, mama. And then she started to drive her crazy like any kid does when they learn to say mama, <laughs> then that's all they say. And that's all I would say. And But I remember sitting there and I put my head down in my lap and just cried because I thought, this is this is what miracles are made of. It, this, this is the stuff that miracles are made of. And so the fact that she's here, the fact that she lived, the fact that she can do this, the fact that she says mama is just beautiful. So she's she's a huge source of inspiration still to this day. I still keep in contact with her family. Mm. And she's she's grown now. I was <laughs> like, why is she so old? <laughs> oh, why is she so old? But um, but yeah, she's been a huge gift. You, you mentioned there were two. Uh, yeah. So one. Zion, Zion is another patient that I had. So I spent the last part of my career on the brain injury unit at Community Rehab Hospital. And so I had a patient named Zion and she was, uh, suffered a brain injury. She was riding her bike and a teenager, and maybe 16, 17 at the time. And she was hit and suffered a massive brain injury. They did not think that she was going to live. And they did not think, even if she did, that she would come out and be okay. So Zion came to us on the unit and she was in really bad shape. And I remember her being confused. I remember her not being able to say her name. I remember her, you know, having to use a memory book. I remember her you know, like the first, like we had her for a long time. So when somebody suffers an injury like that, they stay with you for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. And so I remember the first time we, we got on Facebook after, after this injury and we're trying to figure out like how to, how to do this stuff. And, 
and the thing about her is maybe not so much the word, but just how much she and I bonded. And I remember one night she just looked at me. She's like, I just want to be able to go downstairs and get pizza. And my family's not here. And I just want to get off the unit. And it's a locked unit. Brain injuries are locked units for, for safety reasons. And we can't let our patients just run around in the hallways because they, they're recovering. And so anyways, after work, and I just said, I, you know what? Like, my family's okay. Do you want to go downstairs and get pizza? I'll take you downstairs and get pizza. And so we went downstairs and we got pizza. And it was just just being able to do that kind of little thing for someone and for her to be able to ask and say, this is what I really want. And that want is so simple, right? She just wanted pizza. She just wanted to be a teenager. She didn't. And I think that's so true with so many of us in life. If if you really ask what people want, it's not as grandiose as we think. We're not all like, I want a Lamborghini and an Island. We're like, I want to spend some time with my family. I want to have a little less work to do. It's so fascinating to me how when you really ask people what they want, that it's it's not always what you anticipate. So I feel like we would just end it there. Like that's so perfect how you just ended that. <laughs> <laughs> the end. We're done. Michael, it's been great talking to you. We've solved the problems Best of the universe to you, and we're out. <laughs> I'm I am struck by that has to be such incredibly frustrating day in and day out work. But then the little moments of joy and breakthrough are what sustain you. Is that true? Is is that, yeah. How do you sustain yourself through that frustration? Is it frustrating? Yes. I think anyone who said it for me, for the patient, for everyone yeah. involved, of course it's frustrating. And it's a great analogy for life because... And, and I'm going to make a broad-based statement here. I think we have lost that. We, like, we expect things so instantaneously now that that toil and tribulation of hard work day after day after day for those moments of success, for, for, for whatever reason, I see people saying, I just want the moments of success and I don't want to do all the, the really nitty-gritty pieces, parts of the work. And so I have been blessed as a, a, in my role as a speech language pathologist to sit with people and literally work on one sound in a word at a time. That kind of minutia teaches you a lot about just <laughs> staying in the struggle, right? And trusting the process. Mm, I love that. Staying in the struggle. Uh, I, yeah. I'm going to write that down actually while yeah. I ask oh, this next yeah, question. For sure. <laughs> um, my... You mentioned fear, and that is why so many people don't say what they want or need to say. Um, where where have you typically found that fear based in? Is it a fear to be known? Like, is it a fear that they're insecure? Is it insecurity? Like, where is that fear coming from for most of us who who would vocalize that, okay, hey, I don't have an issue that a speech pathologist has to work with me on, but right. I just... I'm mortified by the thought. Yeah. So the fear that I see in the everyday person is fear of judgment, fear of rejection. The what will people say or what will people think if they really knew that this is how I felt, thought, or this is what I wanted. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to make waves. It's that kind of fear, that primal, I'm going to get kicked out of the tribe if I, if I say anything that doesn't conform. And especially today in, the, in a world where there's a, such divisiveness, what I find is that the middle of the road people are like, never mind, go now, not going to say anything because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of being lumped on one side or the other. And so I just steer clear of the conversation, which is actually the wrong thing to do because we need to be having the conversations now. We need to get in, right? You talk about staying in the struggle. This is the struggle. And so how do we get into these messy conversations and figure out how to have them, have them well, have them civilly? How do we untangle things when things go wrong. So much of the communication teaching that I do, it, we all know what the what the rules are. If, if you really ask yourself, you know how to communicate well. Where we get stuck or where we get afraid is, what if I mess this up? I don't know how to get out of this. And so a lot of it is, number one, acknowledging that you're going to get things wrong. You're going to mess up. 
and trusting yourself, having the confidence in yourself that you can then use skills, use things that you've learned to repair a relationship, restate what you wanted to say, make a correction. Man, perfectionistic behavior and the expectation that people are going to speak perfectly all the time, that's a lot of pressure for all of us to be under. And I don't want people to live that way. We have to be able to make mistakes. We just have to, so... Do people believe you when uh, you know they're they're struggling with that fear, that judgment, that that fear of rejection, and what you said earlier, where you know if we just voice what we want, it's really not that grandiose at all. Is there do you do people struggle with that thought process or connecting those two? Sure, sure, because those first steps are scary. Any th- anytime you do something that is with that's outside of your comfort zone. So speaking your mind for the first time, interrupting your boss in a meeting, having a dissenting opinion, those things are incredibly uncomfortable, right? So we come from a very, uh, you know, when we look at how we're taught from a very early age, we come from this background of we don't challenge authority. You, especially women, you know, too many questions, that's bad. Don't ask too many questions, which is why I love mm-hmm. your the theme of your podcast. I, <laughs> The follow-up question, we need to be asking the follow-up questions. That's how you get clarity. (laughs) So, but people are afraid. They're afraid to ask for what they want. So I I sort of went off on a tangent there, but do they struggle to believe it? Yes, until they start practicing it. So what I always say is I can talk to you about this stuff all day long and I can hand you all the tools. What I cannot do is jump inside your head and, and make your mouth move. Is you've got to be the yeah. one to do it and then to try it and tr- and see for yourself that it works. So how? And that you can, and that you can survive. Yeah. And that you can survive <laughs> when it goes wrong. Right? Again, we're all running around in fight or flight mode all the time. Like, we're going to die. And No, <laughs> you're actually not. You're actually not. In, very, in, in maybe some in, in very extreme cases, if you spoke your mind, maybe you might lose your job. But I find that those situations are pretty few and far between. I can only think of one that I've encountered in my years doing this. And so a lot of times it's it, it, it's just the – it's a mindset thing. It's like, oh, I just I, – I haven't done that. I'm not comfortable doing that, and I need practice doing it. And practicing in lower stakes scenarios and then moving up into higher stakes scenarios is really, really helpful for people. Yeah. Explain that. Um, Dive dive in there without stealing the thunder of your business and what you actually do. (laughs) (laughs) Before I just like down your plane. (laughs) Um, So explain how low stakes scenario versus high stakes scenario speaking. Yes. Yes. So um, let's, let's take it from a business context because I, versus personal. So in, if you are somebody who's struggling to speak up at work, Let's take a lot of times I hear, I am really comfortable talking one-on-one, but I'm not so comfortable talking in a group. So uh, what I would set up a person to do in that particular scenario is let's set you up for success and let's make it a low stakes scenario. So you've got a meeting at work. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to preempt whoever scheduled the meeting that you would like to say something. You're going to preload yourself with whatever it is that you're going to say. And then you're going to ask the person leading the meeting to call on you. So it takes the pressure off of you to have to initiate yourself. You set yourself up for success that way. You are careful about the topic that you pick. So we're not picking something like do or die. Like We're not fighting over compensation or talking about how we're going to fire Joe. We are talking about something, you know, maybe it's the like do we need to continue purchasing this particular app that nobody's using? Like we all bought Slack, nobody's using Slack. Do we really still need to to invest in this? And so then you like, you have an opinion about it that you wouldn't normally speak because you're like, oh, let everybody else decide and let's see what everybody else has to say first. So that's, that's a low stake scenario where you can practice the skills of either front loading a meeting. So you get called on. So you have to talk, you speak out loud, whatever your opinion is, and don't worry about the outcome. And then you can move on once you've had success there to more and more difficult and challenging things because you realize you didn't die the first time you did it. To the, I'm sure you get asked this all the time, or you tell me if you get asked this all the time, do you get asked or, or, 
brought with the situation. I just don't have anything to say. So why do I need to speak up? Why why is it important for me to voice uh, you know my my concerns or my thoughts and feelings when I really don't care? Is is that even a situation? Do you just tell them like, okay, well then move on? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, there are situations where y- you may not have anything to say, and that's perfectly fine. What I find is when people are saying that, but they're sitting in front of me saying, "I want to be a better speaker, and I want to communicate better, and I'm struggling with communication." I don't have anything to say. Is really a cover for I'm afraid to share my opinions with others because I'm afraid of what they will think. Or I don't value my own opinion enough to express it to other people. Where does does that come from? It's not an either or, it's a yes and. Yeah. Where does that devaluing of our own opinion come from? Mm, That's a good question. It's probably unique to each individual person. But when I find people that devalue their own opinion, it's due to insecurity they don't think enough of themselves to find their opinion worthy. And let's be honest, if I don't find my own opinion worthy, why is anyone else going to? It has to start here. You have to believe in your own thoughts, your own feelings, your own opinions enough to be able to speak them out loud and then have the mental flexibility to be challenged and to rethink them. And that gets scary for people too. It's like, well, if I say my opinion and then I can never, ever go back on it, I have to say like, if I just love like, cho- you know, dark chocolate is the be all end all of chocolate. And that's the only kind of chocolate there is. And I say that out loud, then I must stick to that. I can never recant. That's a lie. People go back and revise what they say all the time. We really, um, social media, the news, um, all of that makes us think that what we do is irrevocable. And I don't believe that to be true. I've watched too many people have comebacks and, and restate. And that actually shows a lot of professionalism to come back and say, I rethought that based on what you said. So Michael, you and I don't agree about dark chocolate. And you gave me some really good reasons why dark chocolate dark chocolate isn't the be all end all of chocolate. So now I have a different opinion because you shared yours with me. I shared mine. And now I'm like, hmm, maybe milk chocolate ain't so bad. I've said before on this show and and on social media, one of the greatest signs of maturity is the ability to change one's mind when presented with different facts. Yet it is often changing one's mind is often feared that it will seem immature. Do you find that do you find that to be the case with a lot of the people you work with, that they they see it in a, de- that different way, as you just described? Yes, that it would be seen as weakness or vulnerability, and heaven forbid that we should be seen as weak or vulnerable, but those are actually re- s- s- traits of strength. When we can admit that we don't have it all put together, when we can admit that we struggle, when we can admit that we don't have it all right— that we don't have all the answers. I don't know. I, I, where did we get the idea that we have to have all the answers and that having all the answers makes us all powerful? I don't know, I but don't it know. sucks. Came from school. <laughs> where did that come from? But that's not true. Yeah. What about when the stakes are higher and, and maybe not the actual um, topic being discussed, but the relationship? Uh, instead of being in a professional setting, it's your spouse, it's your uh, significant other, it's somebody that you have a relationship with in some way, your best friend, and you disagree, but you want to get your voice in out. What are the lower stake situations there that can then lead you to have the larger conversations? Yeah. So that's really about where was the relationship before? Like, what are the things that you have done along the way mm-hmm. that build trust? So Have you, throughout the entire relationship, always gone along with what your friend said? Have you ever challenged your friend? So if your friend says, oh, you know, I don't have time to do that. Have you ever pushed back and said, yes, you do? Like, stop playing that video game. You totally have time to do this, right? So I think that those are the instances where trust is built in, that's a pretty low stakes scenario, right? So friend says they don't have time to do the thing that they really want to do, right? So, oh, I really want to write this blog post, but I don't have time. So are you the type of friend to sort of push back and say, "Mm, is that really true? So low stakes scenario. So then when you get to the high stakes scenario, like 
do you do you think the same as me about gay marriage? You you have enough trust built in to know that I can push you and you can push me. And I also think that there also has to be this agreement that it's okay to disagree and we can still be friends. When did we stop doing that? That that um, the only the way that we can be friends with people is if we are a hundred percent aligned with them. I I don't understand that. I don't know why where that came from. But I think if you go into those high stakes scenarios with the mindset of I may not change your mind and you may not change my mind, but my goal is to understand. And that's where the difference really lies is how bad do I want to understand what you think and how bad do I want to change your mind? Right. So I think we get trapped into I got to change your mind versus I've I've got to understand where you come from. And understanding doesn't mean I accept or agree. It just means I understand. What happens in our minds then when we come up against a scenario where there is a really confident person who we either disagree with or they may be flat out factually wrong? And I know we live in a world of alternate facts now, but (laughs) they may be. I'm like, are you describing me? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) But we may not have had the practice. And so we come up against this confident yet wrong person in our minds and we are, you know, perhaps unconfident, but we have this belief. What happens in our minds there? Like what, where, where does our soul or our, our headspace go to? Well, I couldn't speak to everyone else's headspace, but I can speak to my own. (laughs) My mind goes to, I couldn't possibly go up against that person. Look at them. They really think that, that this is that, right. They really believe this or, I'm going to be perceived as being annoying to them. I'm going to start to write stories in my head that I that I don't know whether or not they're true or not. So a truly confident person would take your challenge if you were willing to, to give it in stride. So back to maturity. Mm. So is it a truly confident person or is it a fake kind of I'm like bravado, I'm just putting on a show. And if if and if you pick at me, then that's going to hurt my ego and I'm going to fall apart. So that's what that's what I'm always trying to figure out with folks is how much of this is you're really confident and and so I can ask you questions and you can ask me questions and neither one of us crumples uh, or is it that what I am seeing in you is actually ego and and fake bravado and the unwillingness to change your mind and that's a that's a totally different beast. Did that answer your question when I, you said I what happens so. in my mind? My, yeah. Like, because I can only speak to my mind. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what happens in other people's minds, but I think when we see someone that we perceive as being more confident than we are, and we don't feel good about ourselves, then we shrink, and we don't ask the questions, and then we just think things in our head like, "Oh, look at that person! They have a big head, and they're wrong." And I wish I could say something, but I can't. And now I'm going to make excuses about it, and I'm going to make really big excuses about it, and then I'm going to go hide, and maybe I'm going to write a Facebook post about it. Mm. Very true. Right. <laughs> the passive aggressive Facebook post. <laughs> right? Passive aggressive. <laughs> I, I've lived there. I've played there. I always, I always say I'm an expert in communication only because I have messed it up and done it wrong so many times <laughs> that I now have a few suggestions that might be helpful to people. Maybe. <laughs> I would love to hear um, a, a time you struggled to get it right. I'll say right in air quotes. But when's a time where you've struggled to to meet that level of communication that that you strive for? I think we all strive for, but... Do you have a do you have a moment in time? A single time? No. <laughs> <laughs> what was the first thing that came to your mind? So are you talking specifically about a time where I've encountered another really confident person and I I backed down and I didn't say what I needed and wanted to say? Yeah. Yeah. And how would you handle it differently? Oh my gosh. So when I I'll I'll kind of it's a it's a longer story because I basically spent two years doing this. Yeah. With So when I left speech pathology and I took on a role in corporate America, teaching executive presence, public speaking and storytelling, I went to work for another entrepreneur and she was a very strong, strong person. And when she spoke, she spoke with authority. And when she said things, it was, it, it was like they were facts. 
And her take on the world was that the world would be better if it were pretty perfect polished. And that's what she was looking to create in her speakers, in the executives that she worked with, and especially in her employees. So there were many times, not always, but I would say more often than not, I can actually only point to maybe three times where I stood up to her and shared my own thoughts. Because what I realized quickly was that actually does not align with who I am. I don't believe in pretty perfect polished. I think it actually crushes people. I think if you want to take the fear away from speaking, then you need to make it safe for people to speak. And so, but I spent two years basically doing what she wanted, trying to conform to what she wanted, not speaking my mind, dressing the part, acting the part, and then subsequently losing my own sense of self and value and worth. To the point that I was, I ended up in therapy, I quit that job. And that's actually how I ended up as my own entrepreneur. I never had any intention of being out on my own. I am the world's most unlikely entrepreneur. But I had no idea. I, I I stumbled into the world. I fought this like nobody else's business. I'm like, I am not opening up my own business. That is scary. That's what really smart people do. And I don't, I don't have that. I came from healthcare, 17 years of having a whole world prescribed to me. So uh, I speak from a deep level of experience of, of knowing what it's like, especially in the corporate world to work for a boss that it's hard to stand up to. When I did, and, and, and knowing that when I did, so two things could happen. And this is what I would teach people. When I did stand up to her, it did hit her ego. And it did, I suffered repercussions for that big time. So that, that was a warning sign to me that I would now caution pe- people for is if the, the other person can't handle it, can't, can't come back and have a real conversation with you about it. And I'm talking about, we all get our ego hit and we need some time. We need some time to think, we need some space. But if the other person completely is unable to do that with you, then you need to rethink and reevaluate that relationship because that's not a safe place for you to be. So, right, it's not safe to be with someone who is going to always reject what you think and demand of you something that is not aligned with your values. Alex, you you just kind of dove a little bit into your entrepreneurial start there. What has the last, gosh, 10, how many months are we in into this now? 10 months been like for you where so much of our communication is happening like right now, like what we're doing digitally, we're not face to face. What has it been like for you? How, how has... Uh, I'll ask the question, how has business been? I don't want obviously the numbers, but yeah, like, what have I don't need to see your PL. <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> what has it been like for you? Um, you know, it's been uh, beautifully hard. So mm. I it, it's been wonderful in some ways and incredibly hard in other ways. So when COVID hit, I was on a trajectory to really have this launch into live events and I was doing them and I was coaching people for them. The very last event I did, I did with your guest, Rebecca, stand tall in your story. I was the speaker coach for all of these women. And I'm like, yes, bring it on. This is, this is going to really help my business. And then COVID hit and I spent a month, you know, basically in my basement watching Netflix going, what the heck just happened? (laughs) Somebody help me. And my clients went everywhere and they scattered and nobody knew what was going on. And do I need coaching? And it, it really fell apart for a little bit. And in the midst of that, I had written a book and it was trying to launch, launch my very first book in the middle of COVID. And I'm like, oh my word, how is this going to go? So, but it turned out to be a blessing because what has happened for me is the book did get launched. I mean, it was an awkward, as most of my things are, it's like an awkward launch into the world. It kind of just, it's a, you know, I write, but I write, it's called minivan mogul for goodness sakes, right? I think it takes its awkward drive out of the garage and in the midst of, you know, my release date, when it when it went live was the day after George Floyd. So mm-hmm. I was like, well, I am no longer relevant. I'm going to crawl under my desk. This is this is really hard. This is really hard because I, I, that has to take precedence over anything that I have ever done because holy cow, right? Yeah. yeah. So much trauma. And beautifully, 
what's great about the book and in the business is that COVID just continued to open up this virtual space. So people were like, hey, can you come talk about the book? Or hey, can you can you do your work virtually? Will you help me do my work virtually? You are in entertaining and you're engaging on video. Can you help me do that? So COVID brought with it just more opportunities, things to do like this with you. I mean, I've met people everywhere. I spoke to women all over the globe at, a, at an event that I wouldn't have happened. I can guarantee you that that wouldn't have happened last year if it had if we had stayed in a live environment. And so I'm looking forward to how things go in the future with this hybrid mentality because I do think it will be hybrid. I don't think you can keep people away from other people. Eventually I'm going to hug everybody. Agreed. <laughs> it's, it's just right. I'm just going to hug everybody and it's going to get awkward because I'm an awkward <laughs> hugger and right, I'm going to make it super uncomfortable for people with their permission first, but I'm not going to hug anybody that doesn't want to hug. But <laughs> if you want to hug, it's going to be a little longer than you're comfortable. I'm just warning you now. But I think, I think COVID has, has brought, just so much beautiful hardness into the world, both for the, my business, my family and everybody else. What did the process of writing a book teach you about communication? Oh my gosh. That I would, oh, that, that writing is, is hard. <laughs> Um, I, I've always Period. enjoyed writing. I continue to enjoy writing. I'm getting better at writing. I, I say if it wasn't for punctuation, grammar, and spelling, I would be amazing at it. Um, what did it teach me about communication? I think the greatest, the greatest thing that it has taught me, and people say it all the time, but it really didn't sink in, which is the art of talking to one person. Mm-hmm. So to write like I'm writing letters. And so I think the book does that, but I think next round will be even better and next round will be even better. But to talk like I'm talking to one person, that 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 sort of beautiful communication, which is actually what we teach when we teach public speaking, right? Get up there and talk like you're talking to one soul. Because when you and I get like this, we do all of the things that make speaking engaging, right? When And I said like this, I'm looking at you eye to eye and I'm making the hand gestures and I'm leaning in because I'm talking to one person. When I do that on stage with 300 people, the effect is the same. And so we make this big distinction between public speaking and I, you know, as in I'm speaking in front of 300 people versus individual speaking. And my thought is, is that the same rules apply. The same rules apply. And so uh, taking that pressure off of taking public speaking as a performance and making it into a conversation is really, really helpful for folks. I kind of went on a tangent there, but I hope you were able to follow that. I like tangents. I like tangents because they give me more questions to ask. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Now you have a podcast too, also called The Minivan Mogul. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. If somebody stumbled upon it or or came to it in the show notes of this podcast, what would they find? What would they find uh, you talking about on on your show? Well, they would find two things now. So the first thing that they would find is that I invite guests on my show that I consider to be confidence road warriors. So these are people who have incredible stories in their life either in their business life, in their personal life. Most of the time it's both because it's hard to separate the two. But they have these incredible stories. And so I invite them into the virtual minivan to share their story because I firmly believe that we learn best through story. I mean, I I do the whole like three tips to be a better speaker. I (laughs) I do all that stuff. And I'm like, that's not really what teaches us. What teaches us is when Michael hops into the minivan with me and we have a conversation And it goes all sorts of different directions, but there are nuggets of your story that I'm like, oh, that's so much like me. And oh, that's so useful. And oh my gosh, you've inspired me. So I sought to create this space where I could have people hop in, talk to me like we were on a road trip together 
they can share their story. I can ask their, them questions. And then we just have a really good time. And then I ask them funny questions at the end, like what's their favorite road trip snack and things like that. So I have all kinds of interesting folks that have hopped in with me. And I have a whole new season coming out, season three in March, which with even more entertaining people. I'm so excited. <laughs> and then the other thing that they people will find, and this is brand new and a little awkward for me to talk about, but so the Minivan Mogul podcast also has a sub-series called the Minivan Mogul Goes Sober. So I decided in January that I was going to do a dry January and I started writing to my Facebook group about it. And I'm like, this is really weird and it's awkward and it's uncomfortable and I'm really super uncomfortable, but I need help. And I want to talk about this. And so I started writing about it. And then people are like, I don't read long posts. Can you just talk about it? And I'm like, so I hop on, I hop into the minivan, air quotes, and I share the blog post that I wrote. And I talk about what it's like being on what is now, I mean, I'm on day 13. Like this is like, well, I'm not winning any awards yet, <laughs> but I, I am talking about what it, the adventure, the road trip that I've decided to take uh, in terms of giving up alcohol. So that's what yeah. people will find. All kinds of stuff. I consider this to be a lifestyle podcast, if that if that helps. That does. <laughs> Very good. As we kind of begin to wrap things up, Alex, I've just got a couple more questions for you. Yeah, um, go. At the end of the day, what does becoming a better, someone who says what they need to say, someone who is more confident in the words that are coming out of their mouths, what changes within a person when that happens? What does that do for someone and their environment, their surroundings? What does that do for them? Um, two things. It gives them freedom from the mind trap of insecurity and self-doubt. And it allows people to live as who they are, which I believe is what most people are dying for. They want to be seen and heard and loved for the, who they are, not who they think the right, like not the, not the person that they think they ought to be. So I think it gives people freedom and release. The other thing that it does is it makes it safe for other people to do the same. Mm -hmm. So when I step up and say, this is how I think, if you're thinking it, a thousand other people are thinking the exact same thing. They're just not willing to say it. So you just made it safe. And in a world where there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of fear, I think one of the greatest gifts that we can give to each other is safety. So, How do you want to be known? <laughs> as being real. <laughs> the greatest compliment I get from people, hands down, are when people say, oh my gosh, you're so real. And that to me is freedom because I spent, like you heard a little bit about my story, I spent way too many years trying to be anybody other than Alex Perry, right? I, I always say I tried to executive so hard and failed. I wanted it so <laughs> Like uh, Alex will leak out no matter what, who I am leaks out no matter what. And so the greatest thing, the, the way I want to be remembered is somebody who was just real. And I, I mean, I can't think of anything better like yeah. that. Like she was who she was and what a like, and people love me, hate me, whatever, but I got to be me. And that's, a, that's incredible. Wonderful. Alex, what's a question that you wish you were asked more? A question? Ooh. I got to think about that. Question that I wish I was asked more. Why now? Why now? And people don't ask that question. And so... I, why now? Why speak up now? Why do the work now? Why take the leap now? And this will circle back to my core mission is like tomorrow is not guaranteed. And I say all the time to people, what would you say today if you knew tomorrow that you would never speak again? Mm -hmm. And I saw that every single day, every day. And I don't want people to live that way. I want people to be able to go on with their life knowing that they said whatever it was that they needed and wanted to say. So why now? That's why. 
Beautiful. It's- Beautiful. Alex, how can people connect with you if they want to learn more? Just uh, connect with you and, and find out more about what you're doing. Obviously, I'll link all this in the show notes, but plug yes. away, plug away. Uh-huh. Awesome. Well, you can find me on Facebook, uh, Alex Perry. Uh, you can join the Minivan Mogul Facebook group. And yes, there are man moguls in there. People are like, is this just for women? It says a, a crash course in confidence for women. I have man mo- moguls in the group. You have to be brave right? It is geared toward women and be brave, jump in. We still want you here. Um, so you can join us there. You can find me on Facebook, Alex Perry. You can find me on Instagram at, at PS with Alex. My website is www.pswithalex.com. <laughs> oh, that's so hard to say. And makes me sound 150 years old. Like, did she just say www? Like, where did she come from? Um, yes, I'm, I'm, middle-aged. It's fine. (laughs) And I'm on LinkedIn as Alex Perry. I don't do Twitter because Twitter scares me. Mm. Y'all who are Twitter fans, I have mad respect for you, but you won't find me there. So you got to find me in the other places, but I would love for you to connect with me. Very good. Alex, it has been a pleasure connecting with you on this show. And uh, I thank you for bringing your wisdom and insight. It, uh, it was, it was great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. How often do you stay in the struggle? When something is really hard, when something's difficult, when a conversation with someone you love or know or trust, you know it's going to be hard. How often do you press into that rather than pull away and hide? Ask yourself that and ask yourself why now? What would you say today if you knew tomorrow you'd never speak again? Ask yourself these questions as you reflect back on this episode with Alex. And again, don't forget, sign up for the newsletter at thefollowupquestion.com slash newsletter, where I'll send out more full thoughts on those questions later this week. Many thanks to Alex for sharing her story and insight and wisdom and perspective on the show today. Please do me and Alex a huge favor. Share this episode with someone you know who might also find some value in today's conversation who needs to find their voice, who needs to find their confidence. Share this episode with your network and help spread the good word about the importance of asking more questions. And if you like the conversations with the amazing guests like Alex Perry that I have on this show each and every week, be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And subscribing also helps the show gain more reach. If you ever want to get in touch with me, you can always email me at michael at thefollowupquestion.com or you can go to thefollowupquestion.com and reach out there. I'll catch you on the next episode of The Follow-Up Question. And until then, keep asking questions.